Hello guys, this is Vikrant Singh Sangar, pursuing MBBS from JRMC Gwalior. Now presenting a beautiful lecture on one of the esophageal motility disorder, that is the achalasia cardia. So let's get started. So guys, I have posted my notes on my Instagram account, that is the Integrated Medicos. Do check it out. And today we will discuss the esophageal motility disorder. Out of which the most important thing is the achalasia cardia, and today we will discuss the part one of that. So we will first cover the anatomy and physiology associated with the esophagus, followed by the etiopathogenesis, clinical features, and the complications of achalasia cardia here. So discussed in part one. In the part two, we will cover the diagnosis. That is the diagnosis, followed by the management part. In the diagnosis, we will cover the manometry. Followed by the high resolution manometry and corresponding Chicago classification, and in the management part, we will cover the drugs first. Followed by the endoscopic procedure and the laparoscopic procedure, and at the last, we will cover the most important procedure that is the nodes. The example of nodes is the poem here. Okay, so what are these? We will discuss subsequently, but now we will start with the anatomy of esophagus here. The esophagus or food pipe. The length is 25 centimeters, right, and which starts from C6 and ends at T10 here, right. So, and during the whole course of esophagus, we are just having the four constrictions in the whole course of esophagus. Number one, that is our face, and that is the upper and the lower incisors here. We will measure the distance from the upper incisors to the each constriction here. So that is upper one. And this is the distance between the upper incisor and the first constriction of esophagus here. That is the pharyngoesophageal junction, which is present at the 15 centimeter length from the upper incisor, followed by the second constriction that is at 22.5 centimeter, and that is due to the arch of aorta here. Third constriction that is at 27. 0.5 centimeter and which is due to the left bronchi present here right the left bronchi and last constriction that is at the 40 centimeter and which is due to the diaphragm here so we are just having the four constrictions during the whole course of esophagus such as first one at the 15 centimeter that is due to the pharyngoesophageal junction here right and the second one that is at 22.5 centimeter that is due to the arch of aorta right the arch of aorta and third constriction that is at 27.5 centimeter and that is due to the left bronchi here right left bronchi and the fourth constriction that is at 40 centimeter that is because of the diaphragm here right so this is what the anatomy and the constrictions so the part of esophagus at c6 level that is the pharyngoesophageal junction here Right, and that is the narrowest part of GIT, narrowest part, and having a pressure of 60 millimeter of mercury because that is having the upper esophageal sphincter, right, and which is also the most common site for the iatrogenic perforation. When we just passing the upper endoscopic tube, then more risk of getting perforation of esophagus. Basically, the upper part of esophagus here. So we will discuss now the blood supply of esophagus, right. So having three zones, upper, mid and lower. So in upper third, we are just having different branches. In the mid third, we are just having different ones. And the lower third is also having different branches here. Right? In upper third, we are just having the inferior thyroid artery. That is the inferior thyroid artery. Right? In the middle third of esophagus, we are just having the direct branches coming from descending aorta. Descending thoracic aorta like that. Right? So... These branches so bronchial artery from each side are just supplying the mid part of esophagus here and the lower part the lower third portion of esophagus is being supplied by the left gastric artery here so left gastric artery supplying here right and as far as the venous drainage is concerned the upper part the upper third of esophagus is being drained by corresponding inferior thyroid vein here middle portion that is by the ajagus vein right the ajagus vein here and the lower third part of esophagus is being drained by the left gastric vein. So, left gastric vein is draining the lower third of esophagus and the coronary veins too. Right? 
So this is what the blood supply with respect to the esophagus. So now guys we will discuss the upper and lower esophageal sphincter here. An upper one is playing anatomical and the physiological role while the lower one is just playing the physiological role only. The anatomical means upper esophageal sphincter is a narrow side of GID. So that is the narrowest one, right? And the physiological role stands for this is the area of high pressure. The pressure is more than 60 mmHg, right? So this is the physiological role here. While the lower esophageal sphincter is playing the physiological role, that means the pressure at lower esophageal sphincter is higher, that is the 6 to 26 millimeter of mercury. While the bolus is being transferred by lower esophageal sphincter, that opens at that time only. The pressure at upper esophageal sphincter, that is 60 mmHg, while the lower esophageal sphincter is just having the pressure of 6 to 26 mmHg here. Right. And how does the upper esophageal sphincter made of? That is made by the thyropharyngeus muscle, the cricopharyngeus muscle. So these are the muscle fibers of thyropharyngeus, right? That is the posterior part of pharynx here, right? That is the thyropharyngeus here. And this is the cricopharyngeus. The muscle fibers are horizontal oriented here. And we are just having a space. This is triangular space that is called as Killian's dehiscence and followed by the circular muscles of upper part of esophagus. The circular muscles here as well, right? And the distal portion of inferior constrictor is also making the upper esophageal sphincter here. Followed by the muscles forming the lower esophageal sphincter that is the thickened circular muscle of esophagus. The circular muscles of esophagus is being thickened in the form of the lower esophageal sphincter. The LES is being relaxed pathologically that results into GERD and when that fails to relax, the pathology is the ecclesia cardia that we will discuss subsequently here. Followed by the physiology of what? The physiology of esophageal motility, right? So we just having a peristalsis here. We are having three types of that, the primary, secondary and tertiary. The food bolus after deglutition that enters into the esophagus and that elicits a reflex inside the esophagus to propagate this bolus throughout the length of esophagus and this is done via primary peristalsis, right? So which is the propulsive and progressive in nature, right? That brings the food bolus through the whole length of esophagus and transferring the food bolus from the pharynx to the stomach via whole length of esophagus here. And that is triggered after the voluntary dilutation of food bolus here. Okay. If the food bolus is not able to travel through the whole length of esophagus, the secondary wave is being generated by a esophagus to push the food bolus throughout the length of esophagus to reach up to the stomach here. Tertiary wave is not propulsive and progressive in nature. That is these spastic contractions occurring in the esophagus and that is more commonly seen in the elderly population and that's why the esophagus is called as pressed by esophagus here, right? So now guys, we have discussed the anatomy and physiology associated with the esophagus and now we will cover the etiology of echelasia cardia here. So we are just having various types of echelasia. Number one is the primary echelasia. That is because the idiopathic loss of inhibitory ganglion, the idiopathic loss, right? Followed by the secondary echelasia that is due to Chagas disease, right, which is caused by the trypanosoma cruzi and secondary to this disease, there is development of echelasia, right. Third one is the pseudoechelasia, that is the esophagus and that is the stomach here, right. And when there is development of neoplastic growth at the gastroesophageal junction, then the food bolus is not being transferred from esophagus to stomach, that's why that mimics the echelasia, that's why it is called as the pseudo echelasia. That is more commonly seen in the case of the adenocarcinoma of esophagus and followed by the triple A syndrome. First A is echelasia itself, followed by the A lacrimia, and third A is ACTH resistant adrenal insufficiency, right? So these are the causes how the echelasia cardia develops. And now we will check for the pathogenesis of echelasia cardia here. Okay, so number one, we're just having the etiological reasons, etiological factors causing and triggering the ecclesia. How? Let's check out it.
so guys that is the gut here right and that is circular muscle layer and that is longitudinal muscle layer here right and between the two we are just having the orbit plexus here right orbit plexus and this orbit plexus is just having the inhibitory neurotransmitters such as the nitric oxide and the VIP and whenever there is deficiency of such inhibitory neurotransmitters there is the unopposed contraction of this muscle so this circular muscle gets the contraction here okay so this is the esophagus and that is the stomach here right so this area is being contracted here because of the selective loss of inhibitory neurotransmitters that's why this area, this is the gastroesophageal junction and that is contracted. So due to contraction of the lower esophageal sphincter, the food bolus present proximal to this is not able to transfer to the stomach. That's why dysphagia occurs here, right? So this is what the pathogenesis and there is selective loss of inhibitory neurotransmitters such as the nitric oxide and the VIP from the orbital plexus of LES results in the failure of relaxation of LES, right? and that is causing the obstruction of food bolus to pass through the esophagus to the stomach here. So this is what the pathogenesis associated with the ecclesia cardia here and now we will go for the clinical features of ecclesia cardia and we are just having a triad that is the dysphagia, regurgitation and the weight loss. Regurgitation is acute complication or acute feature here and the weight loss that is a chronic clinical feature of ecclesia since during long time, the patient is not able to stuff well, not able to feed well. That's why the weight loss occurs gradually as time passes by. And this is the weight loss, that is regurgitation, since the food bolus is not being transferred and traveled from esophagus to the stomach. That's why regurgitation of food stuffs will be there, right? And this is the dysphagia here. And dysphagia, that is progressive. Now, as inhibitory neurotransmitters are being depleted, that's why the progression of disease occurs. That's why the dysphagia is progressive and we're just having more difficulty with respect to the intake of liquids than solids and later we're just having same difficulty with the liquids and the solids, right? The halitosis, that is the bad breath, right? Due to the growth of bacteria in the regurgitated foodstuffs and the lodged foodstuffs that is causing the bad breath to the patient here. So now guys, we will discuss the complications of ecclesia cardia here. And now the first one is the aspiration, right? The aspiration of regurgitated foodstuffs and that is able to cause the pneumonitis and pneumonitis that will lead to the abscess formation in the lungs because of the growth and development and the growth of the gut bacteria into the lung tissue and that is called as the abscess formation. So first complication is the aspiration and second complication that is the squamous cell carcinoma here, right? So long time irritation of the esophagus with the contents present at the gastroesophageal junction and that will cause the metaplasia and that is causing, that is predisposing to the neoplastic growth at the esophagus in the form of the squamous cell carcinoma due to the chronic ecclesia cardia here. So this is what the complication is and thank you for watching. So guys, if you're just having any doubt inquiry, you can go for the comment section below. Hit the like button for the sake of the motivation and don't forget to subscribe. Press the bell icon will give me some vibe. So we will meet at the part 2 of Achalasia Cardia. Till then, keep innovating. Thank you.